Welcome to Teaching and, uh, Teaching and Research with Digital Collections, Part 1, uh, Navigating a World of High-Quality Primary Source Materials. Um, I've added our slides for today in the chat, but do let me know if, if um, you joined a little later and those didn't show up for you. Over the next several weeks, we will be presenting on the amazing world of digital collections and how they can be used for teaching and research. So today, for the first of the three-part sequence, we will, be, we will introduce you to some types of content in digital collections, take you to some of the places where they can be found and provide some strategies for engaging their materials. Um, and you'll probably also notice that um, wonderful thank you for enabling closed captions. I was just about to say, you'll also notice that everything that we're saying is in our notes within the slides. So we do try to keep to that script as much as possible, just because both Chris and I feel really strongly about accessibility. And so we're hoping that um, helps with that. So please take advantage. And while you're getting settled with the slide, which again, if we had some more people join, so I'm just gonna drop those again in the chat. Is just joining. Um, and let me introduce myself. Uh, I'm Dr. Pascal Bretzi. I'm a digital research consultant for the Office of Advanced Research Computing, and I work closely with Petri, the uh, Institute for Digital Research and Education. So I also lecture in the Digital Humanities Program and in the World Arts and Cultures slash Dance Department on occasion. I have a background in art history. I've worked with and in museums for well over a decade, including the GRI, the Smithsonian, and the Los Angeles County Museum of Art. Uh, and my dissertation looked at immersive technologies in museums and cultural heritage. So I've been doing a lot of thinking about uh, forms of publication, display, and information capture and transmission. Um, if you ever have any questions or are interested in learning, skill in the age or extended reality, XR, uh, please let me know as we're trying to build out our resources in that area and I'm going to make sure that it uh, will fit with what the UC campus community uh, needs for their research. Um, and with that, I will pass it over to Chris. Hi everyone, um, I'm Chris Gilman. Uh, I'm Digital Curriculum Program Coordinator with the UCLA uh, Library, Digital Library Program. Uh, my background, of, of all things, is in Slavic language and literatures, um, which really only makes sense if you consider the Russian avant-garde and early century, 20th century aesthetic experimentation in cinema, um, uh, architecture, theater design, and brain science, psychotechnics, and other types of things that popped up uh, in the wake of the revolution. Um, uh, for my day job, I support the integration of digital collections, tools, and practices in the UCLA curriculum, and have been working um, uh, especially um, in the context uh, of um, a teaching and learning uh, with innovation uh, in the um, uh, new Bruin Learn uh, medium. So uh, now that we're here, we'll also be a little bit more direct about our presentation series topic, which is about something called Triple IIF. In a world already saturated with acronyms, putting uh, putting an acronym in our title seems like a good way to scare away people. Um, but believe us, this one is different and it is worth knowing. Technically speaking, Triple IIF, which stands for International Image Interoperability Framework, is a set of API or application programming interface specifications for delivering images on the web. For non-technical laymen, recognizing the icon on the right is perhaps more important. It indicates that the item or collection it marks can be used outside of the source website and in combination with other items and collections similarly marked. Basically, when GLAM institution, that is, the e acronym, galleries, libraries, archives, and museums, first started to digitize their collections, they used many different platforms, formats, and metadata types. They put low resolution reference images online and placed safeguards against reuse on the web. Um, 
High resolution archival images were jealous to guard it offline. As a researcher educated, you or your students would have to view items separately on their various sites. And if you wanted to work with top quality facsimiles, facsimiles, you would have to request and sometimes pay for permission to download files. Assembling a collection or database on your own uh, for your own research and or teaching was really difficult. So in uh, uh, 2011, a consortium of seven international institutions came together to form a standardized method of describing and delivering images over the web, as well as related metadata about structured sequences of images. The resulting agreements and technical innovations fundamentally changed how scholars, educators, students, and the general public can engage with digital collections. By creating uniform standards for high quality research grade imagery online, IIIF compliant institutions support rigorous inquiry with reliably linked resources that was previously only possible with image files. This pool of content is still dwarfed by comparison with what you can find with Google Images or Wikimedia Commons, but it is worlds better and rapidly growing by the day. With hundreds of adopters from around the world, there are now more than a billion IIIF digital objects out there. The digital collections we'll highlight today are all offered in Drupalaya. So to illustrate with a, a standard research use case, um, you'll see here, this is from the Getty Research Portal, um, which is a valuable uh, resource aggregator, and many people use it as a place to start their digital research um, or their digital collection research. Since it brings so many institutional resources together in one place. Um, so for this example, say you find this particular item uh, from the GRI special collection system. Um, and in this case, they're using a different viewer called Rosetta um, that isn't one of the IIIF viewers. So it works great, but it would have, um, if you're if you're using it right, you would have to download the files to use them yourself. And then, if for example, I wanted to share them and I wanted to upload them to a platform um, or you know to a personal image server to bring them into a viewer like Mirador, which is a triple A viewer, and we're going to talk a little bit more about that in detail later. Um, you know, in order to share, I I'd have to have that kind of capacity on my machine and with a server. These are large files. So I'm suddenly I'm personally responsible for having the space and possibly paying for hosting space, as Chris was mentioning, um, rather than pointing to that set of items within a reputable institution. So hopefully that sort of gives you a sense of what the problem is here. Um, and just for FYI, um, many of the Getty virtual collections actually do use IIIF and are also hosted uh, in the Internet Archive, and you can make those um, resources IIIF friendly. We'll talk a little bit more about that actually next week, um, so please tune back in for that. But we wanted to focus today on helping you find and identify IIIF resources. So, why bother with IIIF digital collections when we have Google Image Search and Wikimedia Commons, right? What, why go to this thing? Well, first and foremost, it links to institutional content. This is linked institutional content, right? These are generally provided by the, ins uh, by the institutions that hold the originals and provide them a, uh, provide, they're providing them as a post custodial collection um, for their owners. Um, right. So, in, in other words, in some cases, the institutions hold the originals, they're part of their own physical collection. And in other cases, um, they, um, which we'll see, um, they host them, but the, but the items are held by, uh, by owners and mostly somewhere else. Um, they're high quality. So, they are fast loading, they're rich, they're high, high resolution. Have deep zoom and pan built into the viewers, um, usually for, at those institutions where you can look at them. Um, they're interoperable, so you can use you can use 
content from multiple sources together, and you don't have to relearn how to use it each and every time. They're manipulable, right? So as linked web content, it's size, scale, top detail, rotation, quality, and format can be changed just within the URL, and we'll show you that a little bit so you can test it yourself and, and get familiar with it. Um, there's also annotation capabilities, right? So users can comment on and transcribe and draw on resources in that way as well, because annotation is such an important part of object-centered research. There's also citation, right, built into this kind of a resource. Media content is generally accompanied by just enough metadata and persistent links. Um, and then community. The, the global network of creators and users of IIIF are a dynamic, creative, and welcoming sort. And they provide support and documentation that's really, really useful um, if you're planning on using their material. Uh, so today, we're going to take you on a whirlwind tour through the world of IIIF digital productions, taking a few stops along the way to examine that sample materials. Our presentation is intended to be hands-on in some cases and in certain instances throughout, so it won't just be Chris and I talking at you the whole time. You'll actually get a chance to look at the stuff yourself, and we'll provide time and um, oppor an opportunity for you to participate, to click into the links that are in our notes and see and interact with content yourselves. Uh, following the cosmic distinction of microcosm and macrocosm, we will divide our attention between individual items and collections understood both as curated sets and as an institution's digital holdings. Then we will take a peek under the hood and look at how IIIF items work and how you can work with them. And lastly, how one goes about discovering given that rich collections of content are distributed all around the world. So on to items, and let me pass over to Chris. So first, we wanted to give you a general sense of the kinds of content that might comprise a digital collection. IIIF is expanding beyond image-based content to include sound, movie, image, uh, and even hopefully 3D or immersive formats. Here, we'll focus on four characteristic types which exemplify visual textual hybrids such as illuminated manuscripts, print ephemera, photography, and maps. These kinds of resources range from the priceless to the mundane, from published to archival. They generally resist reduction to simple text, and their value to researchers may depend upon the quality of reproduction, such as high resolution, connection to a physical object, and reliability of the institutional context, provenance, metadata, etc. So let's begin with a hands-on demo of four sample items, which you can see and access on this slide and the next. Okay, so I'm going to click forward here. So we have photography and um, and map, and here we have an illuminated manuscript and um, and patent medicine trade card. Um, so. Choose an item or two of interest and click into the link for the item page. Um, you should see it directly there on the slide or, uh, or if you can see the notes. Um, use the embedded item viewer on the, on the item page to zoom and pan around the images. Um, a single item might be comprised of a single image or two or more to show front and back or even alternative views such as the folding trade card on the, on the right here. Um, books are presented as series of images, um, and that would be a case in the um, uh, in the uh, illuminated manuscript, um, and then in the atlas on the on the right here. Um, uh, which can be viewed sequentially or as thumbnail grids. Um, uh, Let's take a, a couple minutes to go ahead and do that. I'm going to click into one uh, just to um, uh, just to show. There you go. Francesca's 
got the reliable hand. Which one would you like? Yeah, that one's good. So here, for example, we have this um, uh, priceless item in our physical collections and um, and uh, high resolution view of it in our digital collections. I'm going to scroll to uh, one of my favorite favorite uh, page um, folds and just zoom in. Can see some of the uh, extraordinary uh, bird lettering in Armenian. Um, I don't read Armenian, so I don't know what this refers to particularly. Um, but I've seen this item uh, in this page fold uh, in person, um, and the, the reproduction is quite good um, and very usable for, re for research purposes. Um, seeing the physical object is life changing. So go ahead, um, poke around, take a look. Um, and we'd really love to hear um, your thoughts and feedback. Um, if you're uh, willing to share, uh, please uh, feel free to um, uh, put it a note in chat or even better, uh, unmute and, um, and uh, share some of your thoughts. Um, so Adelmar, yes, you can do that with the map. I'll demo that and you can explore yourself. I was also about to ask about the map. There is a function that said download, um, but it, it seems that it's not working. I don't know, maybe I'm doing it in the wrong way. I don't know, but. Um, yeah, so this, um, this is actually a very good um, demonstration of how varied some of the viewers are um, uh, in uh, IIIF collections around the world. This is Cambridge. Um, they do a very nice job, I think, providing lots of context. But um, uh, to see the map, um, this is an atlas, and each um, each page fold, then uh, you can advance by clicking through one, two, three uh, out of one hundred and uh, three images, and then you can also toggle through um, thumbnails here and skip ahead to uh, to ones that might be of interest. Uh, and then within the viewer, you can see uh, down to very specific details, you can read the words and so forth. The UCLA Clark Library owns um, uh, a, a copy of this uh, that is a, a yet another uh, version of this same uh, same atlas, um, and I, I I've looked at it. It is uh, almost impossible to um, uh, view and read some of these more detailed components uh, without a magnifying glass. The the etching is is so fine. So in this sense, the triple I F um, uh, um, delivery of of this of this content. Is extraordinarily valuable, in my opinion, for um, for research, and you can sit right here and access it right away without having to um, fly over to uh, Cambridge. And I think, in terms of download, it should be down at the bottom on that um, left hand side of the right hand panel. Um, and Jimena, if you're running into some technical issues, I'm we're we're happy to troubleshoot that. I'm not sure why that might happen, but it should allow for you to download an image that way. Um, so sometimes with Triple IF, as as we were saying, different viewers um, are at different institutions. They're all using the same image API, which we'll we'll go into sort of the detail of that in just a few minutes. Um, but it, it's why some of these things look a little different on different and, and act a little different on different sites. Um, but we're happy to troubleshoot that for a minute if, you, if you're interested in that particular one and want to copy. Oh, okay. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Any other thoughts, comments, or observations? Anything that you saw that you might not have, or um, any navigation uh, questions or concerns? That you have?
Um, just uh, would you open this same map in Mirador so others can see how it looks? Of course. Uh, okay. So I, so Anwar was asking down here along the bottom, there are a number of different options for how to view it. Um, when you open it in Mirador here, um, it, is, uh, it is loading the Mirador viewer here so you can see it uh, as in its frame. Uh, the item uh, is deep, uh, deep zoomable, as you can see. The same image set that we saw as thumbnails in the in the um, custom viewer um, are available here, um, and then there are a number of different possible settings. So you can view it, let's say, as a gallery, um, or as a book. In this case, it's already a book, but you would see images side by side, um, and then. Uh, Metadata you can open or close, um, as well as uh, add annotations uh, to the item. So we're going to get into this uh, in a second with the Mirador viewer itself, but this is sort of the, the exciting hands-on uh, kind of tool for um, for studying and analyzing uh, multiple items simultaneously um, in comparison. Okay, we're ready to move forward. Okay, so now we want to move on to the collections uh, themselves. The items we just looked at were sourced from various contributing institutions around the world. What we want to illustrate here is how eclectic these collections themselves can be, as we sort of seen just a minute ago, both in content and in form and still be usable together as part of the research process. So here are two collection sites at uh, the UCLA library, just to give you a sense of the variation. On the left is the main digital collection site from which the lives of gospels, patent medicine trade cards, and Will Connell collection were accessed. On the right is the Sinai Manuscripts Digital Library, post-custodial co collaboration between UCLA, which hosts the collection site, and St. Catherine's Monastery in Egypt, which holds the physical items. It requires login access, for example, whereas anyone can view the, can use the main collection uh, on the left without authentication. Um, here are three digital collection sites out there in the world. Um, on, the, um, on the left, the digital Bodleian homepage displays um, hundreds of uh, thumbnails of collections, um, and uh, I'm going to uh, click into it. Okay, thank you. Um, and um, if you click on a link and scroll down, um, take note of the sort of exhibit-like curated display of of eclectic information, um, almost exhibit like. Um, um, and several sections down, you'll see a, a featured collection, the Armenian manuscripts um, down here, um, uh, which suggests a meaningful complement to UCLA's Gladsworth Gospels and the um, Cairo Manasian collection um, in, in, in which it's held. Um, so as uh, as a kind of a research process, knowing what what is out there and um, and how different collections might speak to each other um, across um, across oceans and continents, uh, sort of the heart and soul of what we're doing at Playa. Okay, so now if we click in the middle, um, the Will Connell Museum uh, uh, ex exhibit. Um, this is part of the Smithsonian um, in DC, the National Museum of American History. Um, uh, the Will Connell collection at UCLA might resonate with this site um, uh, from, the, from the museum, 
um, which is more like a digital exhibit in scope than, than a collection per se. It's um, uh, 18 images. Um, nevertheless, as you can see here, the content is uh, available in IIIF um, uh, and can be um, can be studied alongside UCLA's materials um, uh, in a uh, Mirador viewer. Okay. And then on the right, the Cambridge Digital Library um, is the source for Ogilvy's um, Atlas Britannia. Um, no, thank you. Um, and if you scroll down here, you'll see it's a lot of stuff. Um, it's sort of a, um, a Borgesian um, uh, a set of categories of, of topics um, and materials. Um, and sort of tucked over here in the side is um, maps. And so as a collection, this may not be the best way to access uh, Ogilvy's uh, Britannia. Um, and to find it, I just use the, the search. So, as you can see, the, the variation in scope, organization, and even user experience in these sample sites suggests a mixed methods as visual and verbal process for finding, contextualizing, and using AAA digital collection resources, uh, which we'll pick up in the last portion of the workshop. Okay. Um, any thoughts, questions? Um, about the collections themselves or impressions. I just I just wanted to uh, also add that I mean th these are three of the digital collections that, that they're out there, but there are many more. Uh, and just uh, also to add that in Latin America there's only one in Colombia, I think, and there's well I guess one and a half. Because uh, in Mexico, there's also a museum who uh, has some of these images in Triple F, but hopefully there'll be more soon. So um, uh, thank you for that uh, comment, Adamar. Um, yeah, so at the, um, at the end, um, a time permitting, we'll, we'll click into um, some, of the, um, some of the list of sites um, that uh, that that have triple I on content, uh, but I think to your larger point, there's a, a real question about the the, the kind of um, the global um, uh, distribution of these types of materials, of how they're um, uh, how the different um, uh, peoples. Uh, cultures, experiences are, are represented. Um, Triple IF itself originated um, uh, around the sort of sweet spot of representing uh, illuminated manuscripts, which is um, you know, a, a certain type of tradition and it's been working uh, at, outward from there. Um, uh, uh, other programs, initiatives, efforts, in, um, at, uh, particularly at, um, at UCLA, um, such as um, uh, the Modern Danger Ar Archives Program, um, uh, uh, Rachel, I, I saw this uh, in, in the, uh, uh, in, on the Zoom, uh, who, who runs that program, are, are working to, um, uh, to better distribute the, uh, the representation of, uh, of these items, its coverage, uh, and so forth. But it's an ongoing um, uh, and probably endless uh, effort and project. So now we're going to talk a little bit about working with AAA objects or items. Okay, so um, even a little bit more hands on um, on this page, um, we pro provided an example from comparative study, um, such as how the commercial photographer Will Connell converted photographs into additive photos. 
Um, we're going to demonstrate how content can be pulled out of its source site and placed into a separate viewer for comparative study. The viewer is Mirador, which is linked at the bottom of the slide. The two items are related images by Will Connell, also linked. Um, so go ahead and click into the um, uh, first item on the on the left. Okay, and you should see uh, the item in page and context. It has a lot of um, uh, metadata, and then down here is the manifest URL. Um, and don't panic if you click on it and you end up with a whole bunch of Code. It's JSON. <laughs> complicated code. Um, structured, structured data. <laughs> right. Um, but we're going to um, use one part of that, and that is the the URL. How do I copy? Okay. Right. So now we're going to. Um, All right, and we're going to go um, down here to the link for the Mirador viewer. So this is UCLA's instance of Mirador. It's a technology that was developed mostly by um, Stanford and Harvard, um, and it's free and open source. We are hosting it here, and we're going to add a resource. So if you click in the bottom right-hand corner and paste in the resource location, thank you. And click add and you should see it appearing up at the top here i'm going to go ahead and click on it and it will load in the mirror viewer right and now i'm going to go get my second item i'm going to click on the triple if logo and again don't look at the code behind the curtain. I'm just going to grab the URL. Thank you. And go to my mirror door. I'm going to add by clicking the plus sign in the upper left. Okay. And I should see the second item. Oh, I did the same thing twice. Try this again. But what's great is that once you've added it, it remains there in your in your sort in your sort of added collection, so you can always go back and add it there. All right. So this allows you. To look at minute details for comparison. You can drag items around vertically, horizontally. Um, you can do uh, any of a number of different things. You can change the settings. For example, to slide them around. It's a very flexible little um, uh, little workspace. We're going to get into that and other other tools for working uh, with Triple F. But the general principle here is to understand that items that come from two places in the same collection, or um, uh, or in um, from two different collections, uh, can be studied um, rigorously um, through visual analysis in a, in a viewer such as this. Okay, so now that we've played around a bit um, and see what's possible, I wanna just take a step back here and break it down a bit to discuss how all this is happening uh, so that you have a better understanding how the underlying technology is structured for this type of functionality. Um, so IIIF image API lets you use image data the way that you want to. 
And we're going to show what we really mean by this. So first, um, in case you weren't aware, we've mentioned this before, but I'm just going to say it again. API stands for Application Programming Interface. And as the IIIF documentation states, quote, this API was conceived to facilitate uh, systematic reuse of image resources in digital uh, image repositories maintained by cultural heritage organizations. It could be adopted by any image repository or service and can be used to retrieve static images in response to a properly constructed URL. Um, that construction looks like a link and it allows you to specify the region, size, rotation, quality characteristics, and format of the requested image. So you do all of that by what you write in, in the URL, um, essentially. So when we're working with IIIF resources, we're working with linked media. That's the really important thing to note here. Um, and that linked media is being hosted by reputable institutions that um, then we can manipulate their collections for our, our own purposes using their IIIF API. So let's try something out um, to help us better understand what this means. So for me, seeing is believing, so we're gonna actually do this ourselves. Um, I'm gonna place a link in the chat as a, um, where you can actually access it in your notes, whichever you prefer. Or I should put a slide notes so that you're actually not asking ask everybody. Um, and this is a resource developed by Jack Reed, which uses the image API to allow for us to manipulate an image on the fly. So we're gonna go ahead and open this up. And um, what I'm gonna ask you to do here is to, if you see on my next slide, right, I actually have here, what, what we wanna to do together. So we wanna change the size to 10. We wanna try rotating the object 90 degrees, and then we wanna try switching the region to the full uh, rather than these coordinates. So what does all that mean? Well, let's, let's actually take a look here. So this is the structure right above, right? It's the structure that we, of a, of a URL. And so we see the HTTPS, right? And then we have the server that it's calling, calling the image from. Um, we have a prefix and we have um, some other information here. But then we have region, size, rotation, quality, and format. And so we can adjust um, any of these to be able to adjust what, what kind of image we get served. So for example, if I change the size to 10, right, as I said we should try doing, all of a sudden the image gets really, really small, right? Um, so just by adjusting that number within the image URL, we can adjust its size. Now, if I can go back, right, bring that back, and it comes back to that original size. Now, if I wanted to rotate this image, right, I could try adjusting the rotation. So let's try adjusting it by 90 degrees. Now we see that our image of Martin, right? We just celebrated MLK Day. So our image of Martin Luther King Jr. has just shifted, so he's now looking directly down. Um, if we go back, right? We can, you can see if I have just have nine, it's kind of a skew. So you can play around with degrees of rotation using that part of the URL. Now, finally, you'll see over here in this region section, right, we have coordinates. So this is, these are coordinates of the entire image. That means that this has been cropped to show just this perspective of Martin. But if I enter full here, instead of coordinates, I can actually see the entire original image. And we see that he's actually here at a demonstration um, alongside many other people. It wasn't just him alone. He's always out there with the people um, doing his thing. So that's an example of how 
once we once we look at the URLs where these images are posted, we can actually manipulate them for our own use. Um, does that make sense to everybody? Does anybody have questions about that? So by changing the, the request parameters um, that we are we're we're essentially making of the image server where the image is being posted, we can have a different image be returned to us. Um, the image itself isn't changing at all. The only thing uh, we are changing is how it appears on the web service. So let me go ahead and switch back to our slides up here. Um, so as any researcher who works with visual materials knows, adjusting images um, is just step one. Step two is presenting them in a meaningful way. And that's where the IIIF presentation API comes into play. Um, and you've seen some examples of that already with mirror work. Um, but both the image API and the presentation API are written in what's known as JSON or JavaScript object notation, which is a fairly readable data interchange format. This is what allows for the standard, the standardized description of a collection of images in terms of their structure, layout, and then presentation. And the presentation API allows for collections to be formed and for compound um, items to, to be made. For example, you see on the right here that a, um, a 15th century book of hours, which is a Catholic prayer book from France. And when the library is preparing this manuscript for digitization, they're taking pictures of each folio or page, right? Which you can see in the menu on the left. And if I switch to the book view, which uh, so that the, the folios are side by side, that arrangement can happen seamlessly because the image data is structured in a way that allows for all those images to be understood and um, read as a collection and that certain pages are connected to other pages. So they can display properly based on our settings in that data. So this is then further complicated when we add in annotations, which becomes an additional connected data structure. Um, or a set of data structures. And the documentation uh, for the presentation API is a bit lengthy, um, but I linked to the latest version here on this page um, and on the left below this diagram that demonstrate how uh, the units of the, the presentation uh, API link up. Right? But most of the time as users, we'll be dealing with the front end. I just really wanted you to be aware of these JSON structures because when we start to move things around to compare, um, they become more and more important. And so here are um, two IIIF viewers that I want to make you aware of when we've mentioned, I think both of these already, um, but there are really of actually a number of presentation tools that have been developed for, for the IIIF presentation API. And we might show you some of those, uh, a few more of those next week, but the two most common ones that you should be aware of are the Universal Viewer and Mirador. So UCLA is investing in making our special collections material IIIF compatible, which is incredibly exciting. And all the UCLA digital collections are currently using the Universal Viewer as the main display um, sort of viewer for, for our collections. For example, there, um, or here is, let me click into my notes here. Oh, here we go. Just, just as um, one exception, so that we show the digital collection from a visual site, those are um, presented in the Universal Viewer, but the sign on manuscripts, uh, on the other hand, are presented in Mirador. Right. Great point. Um, and so, for example, here's a, an incredible photograph of our USC colleague, Patrice Russian. Uh, that is part of the James Arthur Jazz Photographic Collection. And 
Um, this, the sphere, this viewer probably looks pretty familiar now, but it allows you to have that, those zoom capabilities. Um, it'll shift if there's folios that are available. It'll have a download feature here on the left and we have some settings up here on the right, right, that you can, you can access. But this is a, a very sort of standard view of the universal viewer um, in the UCLA collections. This does sort of look different depending on what institution is hosting the universal viewer, but it will look roughly similar to this no matter, um, no matter what. And the universal viewer also can handle 3D content, which is really exciting as well. Um, and that's being expanded as um, in addition. So more on that, again, in upcoming workshops. Um, we also have our own instance of Mirador, which Chris mentioned before, and uh, you're free to use that in your research and classrooms. Um, I'm gonna go ahead and click into that just for a second here. I mean, it comes populated, as you probably noticed, with many resources sort of already in there. Mirador allows you to view multiple collections side by side, which Chris demonstrated. Um, I do want to just show uh, one, one thing very quickly, which is we actually, we demoed, did we demo the annotation already? No, not yet. No. no, we didn't demo annotation. So I want to quickly show you what annotations look like, and then we're also going to look at how you can bring in collections um, or, or resources as a whole collection. So here in Mirador's own website, they have a demo that you can access. And in this demo, you'll notice um, here on this portrait of Vincent van Gogh, we can click up here to toggle our, our sidebar on, and you'll see in some instances of Mirador that we'll have this annotations button. If we have the annotations button, what you'll see is a list of any annotation, text annotation that's associated with it. Now, in some cases, you can actually Picture the annotations. Yeah, you know, okay. Let's try, try clicking them again. Ah, here we go. Yeah. And then we can actually we can turn them on so that they're viewable. So in this particular instance, um, where an annotation server is connected, um, we'll set up for your instance of Mirador, you can see that that users can drag and select different aspects of the painting or resource that they want to annotate and can add an annotation. So here I can navigate on the side panel or I can click in here and select those different windows and see them highlighted on the left. So this is some really great functionality that's available with IIIF or Mirador uh, examples, right, where, where annotation is enabled. Now, it's not always enabled, um, you do have to have an annotation server set up, but we'll talk a little bit more about that next week. I just wanted you to be aware of that capability. Um, you can also bring in resources as a collection. I'm going to go back to my slides here just so that you can see. Here we go. Um, so you're welcome to follow along for this portion um, and, and give this a try for yourselves. Um, but I just want to briefly demonstrate how you can bring in a whole collection at once. Um, so this, I'm going to click into this. This is the caption collection, which is just the coolest in my opinion. Um, and we can take a look at the page here. It's a, it's a fashion, theater, and film costume design collection, which is really, really neat. And you'll see there's a manifest URL here. Um, so Again, if we click into that, right, we're going to end up with this really, really long list, essentially, of structured data. This is the whole collection as data. As So these are all the links where, where on the server you can find those particular things in the collection. And what we really care about is this URL up at the top um, for that collection. What I'm going to do is I'm going to copy that URL. Right? And I'm going to bring it into Mirador. So 
I'm going to go down here and I'm going to add resource. And I'm going to paste in that collections manifest. Now, an image isn't showing up right away and you can see it's sort of flashing. That means it's loading. This is a really long, uh, really large collection. So you need to give things a minute to load. Um, but once it does, here we go. Once it does, here we go. It gives me a list of all the things in that collection. And I can pick from that list and bring in one particular item. And then say I wanted to bring another item in into a side by side comparison, like uh, Chris was showing earlier. Well, I can just click in again to the collection as opposed to the single item, right? It pulled out that single item that I had already selected, but now I can go back into the collection. And again, it takes a minute to load. But you can see now it's moved this individual image to the left and it's given me the opportunity to choose again another piece here on the right and so I can do side-by-side -side comparisons um, very very easily using uh, this uh, manifest URL which allows me to bring in the entire collection at once. Can you add one more just so we can see? Sure yeah so you want to be able to see sort of what it looks like when you add more, mm -hmm. more things because you can add Many, many things within a corridor. So again, your viewer kind of gets a little, little more squash. I can move this over here if I wanted to. I could have it um, in a set of three. And then we can see all of these things just side by side. Look for actually and see, oh, these pieces are quite similar. It's like maybe that's a, a sketch that is used again and again, right? Um, and the costume has changed, but that face is the same. These are the types of things that you're able to do using Mirador um, and Collections manifest links. Um, I'm not going to show much more than that today in terms of viewers because that'll be our focus next week. Um, however, we wanted you to know about them so you can see some of what they offer. And Francesca, can, yes, please. can you go back to that three uh, uh, instance oh, yes, on the mirror door? Are you able to do annotations here in the uh, UCLA mirror door now? So um, no, because the, uh, the, if, they're, if they were already set up, if, the, if there was an annotation server set up, then you would be able to do that. But because an annotation server hasn't been set up for this instance of Mirador, we can't add annotations. Um, annotations, if you want to be able to add annotations, that requires uh, usually user login. So there's a, a element of security so that they can track who, what user is adding what login. Um, and then also it needs storage to be able to store those annotations. It's something that we're working on. Um, Chris and I have been actively talking about it for a, a little while now. We may have a hack soon um, so that you can do it independently uh, using Omeka, but for, for now, um, you can at least get things side by side and do that. So th thank you, Chen Ling, for that, for that question. Um, yes, we're um, uh, actively seeking uh, ways to make annotation possible and to figure out contexts in which annotations would be viewable and shared among different, different readers. So what Francesca particularly um, uh, is working on is individual um, uh, research annotations under the auspices of OR. Um, and then the broader picture is how do we establish annotation as a um, core proficiency for all students uh, at UCLA so that annotations could be shared within um, course contexts. So most importantly here to note is that uh, 
how with IIIF a paradigm shift is happening in terms of methodology? Well, we're moving away from having to access content through portals to having portable uh, digital objects that you can work with yourselves in virtual environments. Um, so I will pass it back to Chris. Okay, so now we piece it on IIIF, both a la carte, by item, in critiques, by collections. Now comes the check, the downer side. It's frankly difficult to find what you're looking for in the IIIF world. The IIIF community is working really hard on discoverability, but it's a work in progress. In the interim, and more importantly, as a matter of information literacy, we suggest fundamentally inverting the widespread conception of research as search, something Google accelerated but did not invent. User experience web navigational terms like explore and browse suggest leisure activities when serious searchers want to get directly to what they need. But physical archival researchers often don't know what they need until they get past the finding aid and into the actual holdings themselves. Similarly, with digital collections, taking the time and energy to survey the lot using simple settings changes, such as gallery view instead of list, and increasing the number of items loaded on page will lend rigor to the practice of visual inspection. This principle and advice holds at the level of institutional collections, and even more broadly, to the domain of IIIF content providing institutions. It may seem old school, circa the 1990s, but the interim solution of lists and lists of lists actually provides an open view into the thinking process of an emergent community of librarians, curators, and technologists as they pull together resources. So Adelmar suggested um, uh, earlier in the, the presentation, uh, here is just one IIIF website guide for starters, but there are many others out there. So if we click into it, um, we can see um, that this is not final or definitive. But it is a hub resource because it's the triple IF website itself, and there are many contributors to it. So this list of um, of institutions that comply with the triple IF standard is a good starting point for browsing and understanding essentially what's out there um, in the triple IF world. Uh, for example, um, lists of lists, right? Uh, Benjamin Albertson from Stanford has assembled this great list uh, to get you started as well. And I'm also sharing his three part triple IF tutorial in our notes if you're interested in looking at that and exploring more kind of triple IF content and the community that's out there. Um, just also note here at the bottom of, of this slide, there's also a browser plugin. And I may try to show you that, um, how to get that up and running in another workshop down the road if people are interested. So just let us know if that's something of interest you'd like to see. Um, and just to sort of wrap things up, um, if you like what you've seen here today, we really do encourage you to get involved. The IIIF community is very open, welcoming, and enthusiastic, which is a real plus. And it's also quite strong, and there are many ways and levels at which you can get involved, whether it's just registering for a newsletter or joining one of their several working groups. Um, we've got a link uh, here in the notes for their webpage on how you can get involved, um, but we won't go into too much detail about these things right now. We just wanted to point out um, two elements in particular here. Uh, one is the, uh, the IIIF consortium list and that's the, the um, set of institutions that Chris was just referencing that are actively involved in setting the standards for IIIF. 
And as, as you mentioned, these, this is a great list to mine for institutions who are actively surveying their content, how best AAAF made their content. Um, and then there's also the AAAF community page. And there is, um, on that page, it set up calendar events for all different kinds of various working groups that are meeting. And you can feel free to jump in on any of those um, calls at any time if you're interested. So for example, there's one on museums, there's one on 3D content, there's one for discovery, uh, there's one for maps, and so on and so forth. They really have uh, many, many different working groups and they are very friendly, so feel free to jump in on any of those calls at any time. Um, and with that, I think that's, that's it for today. Um, we love any questions that you have for us. I hope that this uh, gives you a few ideas on how you might start using APIs and how you might start exploring AAAF based selections for your own research.